Yeah, uh, everyone, thank you very much for participating in the international webinar on science technology policy at the turning point uh, by the Tokyo Foundation. Uh, I am the principal investigator of the project at the Tokyo Foundation for Policy Research. The, the project is called Reconstructing the Science and Technology Policy System. So it tried to uh, deal with the issue of the, the science and technology policy making process and new approach for dealing with that, how the various stakeholders and the actors should be uh, involved and what should be the kind of the interaction mechanism among them, and also what are the possible policy tools uh, which can be utilized in the process. So we'd like to advance our study based on the case study and the, the cross-sectoral comparison or the international comparison. And actually, this project began just recently, uh, last October, and uh, this is the first uh, relatively big event uh, which we organized. So one of the important purpose of this the, the, the webinar is to set up uh, the series of the issue agenda setting uh, for the next uh, two and a half years to come for, uh, to, for completing uh, this project. So in this project, we have the big three theme uh, uh, in our project. The first one is the issue of the cross-sectoral uh, collaboration uh, because, for example, for dealing with the risks of the technology, we have to deal with a different type of the risk. So the safety or the, 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 the security and so on. So we need to have a holistic view on that. That's one of the big theme. And second theme is the, the public-private partnership and also the private-private partnership relations management issue. And third issue is the increasing importance of the security in the science and technology policy, especially in the geopolitical uh, rivalry uh, context. So among those three big themes, today we try to focus mainly on the two uh, big issues, the holistic cross-sectoral uh, collaboration issue and public-private and private-private uh, collaboration issue. So, so having those kind of the structure in mind, we organized uh, two uh, sessions uh, this morning. The first session uh, will be on the, the cross-sectoral governance of the emerging technologies. Uh, and second session is on the law and the limitation of the private sector in innovation. So we have uh, about one hour and uh, the, the 20 minutes uh, for each session, and in between, we have a, a short break. And the concerning the log logistics, uh, we'd like to uh, repeat again that uh, we have some slot for, for, for discussion and uh, the question and answer. For discussion, we begin discussion among the, the panel member, uh, but we have, after that, the session for the Q&A. So I would like to ask you to give us a question or a comment using a Q&A function of the webinars, uh, putting your name and application. And if it is a question, please specify to whom you'd like to ask. Uh, we are not sure we can deal with all the questions, but uh, I think that giving us a question is very uh, important for, for the future of our research. So that might be very helpful. Okay, so before going into the, the first session, I first would like to introduce the, the, the presenter and panelist of today. The, for the, the, the keynote speaker for the first session, we have uh, Professor Kenneth Oe, uh, Professor of Political Science and at the Mass, Mass, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, thank you very much for participating. And uh, for the second session, we have uh, Professor Sebastian Le Chevalier, professor at the Ecole de Haute Etudier en Sciences Sociales uh, in Paris, and also he is the president of the uh, Foundation France Japan. Uh, thank you very much for participating. So th those are the, the, the two guest speakers. Then we have a panelist from the, the research project at the uh, Tokyo Foundation for Policy Research on Deconstructing Science and Technology Policy System. So myself is the, the Hideaki Shiroyama, the research director at the Tokyo Foundation for Policy Research and also the professor at the University of Tokyo. 
And uh, we have uh, 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 Professor Makiko Matsuo, the, the senior fellow at Tokyo Foundation and uh, uh, associate professor at the University of Tokyo. Then we have uh, uh, Professor Mitsuo Kishimoto, the research director here at Tokyo Foundation, and also the professor at uh, Osaka Universities. Yes, and then we have uh, Professor Kazuto Suzuki, research director here, and also the professor at the University of Tokyo. Then we have uh, uh, Toru Yoshioka Kobayashi, the, the senior fellow here at Tokyo Foundation and uh, assistant professor at the Hitotsubashi Universities. And uh, finally, we have uh, uh, Akio, Mr. Akio Kurokawa, the senior fellow here at the Tokyo Foundation and also the, the senior manager at the Kanagawa University of Health Services. So those are the members who are sitting on the table today. Okay, so now I'd like to uh, turn to the, the first session. The first session is on the, the cross-sectoral governance of the technologies, uh, emerging technology. So we have two uh, key presentations, then we have uh, time for discussion and question and answer. So first, I'd like to ask the Professor Ken Oe. The floor is yours. Please start your presentation. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Shiriyama. Uh, and also, I'd like to express my thanks to the Tokyo Foundation for Policy Research. Uh, let me get right into the presentation. Um, what this talk will do is first introduce some concepts uh, how to govern risks under uncertainty, and there is very significant uncertainty associated with emerging technologies. And then I wanna go through a series of retrospective and current cases. These are nominally biotech, but they also combine a great deal of information technology in them. And then just when I've offered solutions to the very difficult problems that we face, I'm gonna undo all of the progress with the closing conundrum. And the problem uh, that I'm gonna end with is that as we try to figure out how to govern benefits and risks, uh, we run into a difficulty because the information that is needed to make decisions on these issues itself can present information hazards. So let me begin with some principles, approaches to risk governance under uncertainty. Um, the first two approaches are familiar. Uh, one can talk about permissive approaches where you allow an innovation to take place unless if environment, health, security are clearly compromised. And then after the fact, you react if a crisis materializes. The precautionary approach, you limit innovation unless if environment, health, and security are clearly protected. And uh, both of these have benefits and have risks. The permissive approach is often viewed as being, quote, pro-technology, but the problem is that after problems materialize, backlash may actually greatly limit innovation and adoption of technologies. Um, in Japan, obviously, post-Fukushima, the nuclear industry restarted in Germany. It did not. In the United States, problems with gene therapy locked down research in that area for some time. Precautionary approaches, the idea of, again, waiting for proof before allowing. And while one area can do that, commonly what happens is that you have diversion of innovation to less regulated areas. And that diversion can itself heighten risk as well as deny the fruits of innovation to those areas that are adopting precaution. The European Union on genetically modified organisms, the US on stem cell research, all would be examples. Now, the approach that I'm gonna argue for is a planned adaptive approach, and that's gonna be a theme throughout many of the examples. And the idea here is to openly acknowledge uncertainty at the top. Appreciate that our understandings of benefits and of risks are gonna be imperfect and we're gonna be learning as we go along. And the approach would call for preparing by funding research to inform our priors on benefits and risks then begin by discriminating and going with early applications where you believe there's limited risk and greater benefit. But most critically, set up in the beginning to observe, set up in the beginning to adapt and learn from experience to update and correct practices. This approach is a no-brainer. 
it's obvious that one should do this, yet in practice, it's a little bit more difficult uh, to do in, uh, than one might believe. So let's go through some current and retrospective cases, and I'm going to work from the easier cases toward the harder ones. But to begin, we have to understand why technology is changing rapidly. And this part of the story is really very much cross-sectoral. Bioengineering is changing rapidly, but in part it's because information technology is changing rapidly. The enabling technologies are developing at extraordinary rates. Now we have a series of graphs, some from MIT, some required to have graphs and charts. Those are log scales, exponentials on the vertical axis. If you look at the left, making DNA, the cost and the speed of DNA synthesis, and reading DNA, the cost and speed of DNA sequencing, our ability to make and read DNA has been improving at extraordinary rates. You can see that blue line, which is on sequencing, and you can look at the yellow line on gene synthesis, big changes taking place. A consequence of the changes is that a tremendous amount of additional information has been thrown off. And if you look at the middle graph, it is really a graph on the deposition of information, genomic information in archives. And very rarely do you see an exponential graph with a vertical line or a near vertical line in it. That vertical line is new genomic information being deposited of late. Now, you put together that information and there's another revolution being represented by the photographs on the right side of the diagram. And it's advances in characterizing and designing DNA. And a lot of that is information technology. The gentleman in the uh, upper right-hand corner, Manolis Kellis, is one of the smartest guys I know at MIT. And he's someone who is in both AI, machine learning, and biological engineering. And he's been putting together incredible data sets and using machine learning to figure out what to edit, what to change to guide his designs. Uh, he has actually come up with uh, an obesity gene as one of his discoveries. But then the other faces that you see here are, are world famous for good reason. The woman in the lower corner, Jennifer Doudna, is a critical inventor of CRISPR uh, gene editing. And advances in gene editing as you go from zinc fingers and talons to CRISPR and later to base editing, have had the effect, a remarkable effect, of allowing people to actually do and implement their designs with much greater ease. The synergisms and the combination of all of these advances mean that change is taking place at a far more rapid rate than is typical in the sciences. And that change is one of the attributes uh, that complicates risk management. So if we turn to emerging applications, and we're going to start with ag and go to industry and medicine and environment. And again, the first example is a relatively easy one. It's fish. So our fish story here is uh, one of a company that modified salmon by inserting genes from Pout and Chinook. And the idea was to help the fish put on weight more rapidly. The skinny little fish in the foreground and the big fish in the background are the same age. And the alterations allowing the fish to grow continually and year round worked in terms of weight gain, but the risk issues here are, do you want to eat the fish? What about food safety issues and environmental issues? What happens if there's a release? In this instance, FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine did a careful assay of the tissue and concluded that there were no significant compositional differences, particularly with respect to growth hormone. On environment, they started to require more than is typical. FDA said, we want physical containment. And so all the fish were in land-based tanks. Geophysical containment, if they get out, the cold water adapted salmon would be in a high water temperature area and would die. And then biological containment, coming up with organisms and designs that would limit release by building in safeguards into the organisms. And so you have sterile triploid adults all females. And the idea here is that, uh, again, to limit reproduction, reproduction across um, the modified species. We all know from our vast experience with the movie Jurassic Park that uh, these strategies work. Well, they actually have worked reasonably well, but concern has still limited the acceptance of these technologies. 
And there is perhaps a difference between risky valuation and governance and acceptance and legitimacy of same. Industry. Let's go through a couple quick examples here. Um, in terms of industrial applications, you can talk about low value applications, making synthetic, making biofuels, for example, using algae. And because it's low value, typically those kinds of applications are going to be in lightly contained settings of the sort that you see in the images at the bottom. But because they're lightly contained, you have to worry about environmental release, and you have to worry about fitness, and reproduction, and propagation, horizontal gene flow, and even mutation. So approaches to risk governance, in this case, uh, the Smithsonian Wilson Center, US EPA, and our group at MIT put on workshops, but the workshops were more than just sitting around talking. We were trying to identify things that needed to be followed up on and researched. The properties of the workshops I just want to mention quickly. Uh, I was shocked and surprised at something good that happened. We had industry, the guys at the top uh, from the major algal biofuels companies. We had the regulators, um, Mark Siegel, the guy with the glasses and the microphone. But we also had NGOs, civil society, the leaders of the campaigns against synthetic biology are sitting in the middle of that lower right-hand slide. Um, and on either side, they're flanked by representatives of industry. And it wasn't just a question of people being polite to each other. They disagreed over their acceptance of the technologies, but they agreed remarkably enough on what we needed to know more about, what some of the gaps in knowledge were. And it allowed us to reach something approaching consensus on the research that needed to be done. Uh, we also needed research to limit the risks of release, and we also needed research on how to monitor effects and evaluate environment. And the good news is that a number of research groups have been working on limiting risk, and the US EPA funded research on methods of testing, and the first grants on that were actually awarded last summer. I also wanna note on the theme of public-private partnerships, that one of the nicest things that came out of this, one of the gentlemen in the companies involved, from the companies involved, walked away from this and decided that his company privately had to focus much more on research on potential environmental effects of the work that they were doing. And their private research on effects of their own projects dwarf in size the EPA funded activities. And uh, we actually have public and private actors working uh, seriously on better understanding of problems. Industrial applications, making high value materials. So you can be talking about making drugs. Uh, you could be talking about making even scents and flavors, uh, vanillin. And the example I wanna talk about is one that I was involved in where I was contacted by a biological engineer early on. And he said, Ken, I'm working on going from sugar, glucose, to morphine, brewing it using yeast and modifying the pathways in yeast, do you think there might be risk and policy implications? And the answer is yes. How long will this take? And he said five years. Six months later, he said that he was done and um, that they wanted to publish. And they at the same time wanted to encourage publication of a piece that would be on the risks associated with it. So to make a long story short, our group did put together a team and we wrote a book, uh, wrote a little piece in nature called Regulate Homebrew Opiates. Many, many points could be made. Um, you had two labs that were working in this area, one at Stanford and one Berkeley, Calgary and Concordia. And both labs came up with pathways to go from sugar to morphine and codeine. Now, what does it mean to govern risk? So. A number of the recommendations here are pretty straightforward. Lab security, obviously. Reduce the appeal of the strains, make them easily traceable, harder to cultivate. And then personnel security. So this was the point that actually got interesting. We went to experts and talked about the things that you would wanna to do to select staff to be working on something as sensitive as this. And they went through that list of disorders that you can see on the left, psychological disorders like psychopathy and narcissistic personality disorder. 
other risk factors, financial stress, status insecurity, sleep deprivation, perceived unfairness. And we were sitting there smiling and thinking that we were doing a good job on risk governance until we realized that that bottom list of risk factors describes every postdoc and graduate student in the world. And the top list, our graduate students suggested, describe all faculty in the world. Uh, the point here is that although you might be able to take care of the technical issues and physical containment, uh, there is serious difficulty addressing, if you will, personnel security issues. Medicine. So the applications to medicine are probably much more complicated than the ones we've talked about so far. And to underscore uncertainty, gene therapies are now accepted by us all. We all think that it's not problematic, but the early days of gene therapy actually had big problems. The University of Pennsylvania was a leader in this area. And we forget now that in the very early stages, two of the subjects died. One was a football player, a teenager, and um, the headline suggests that his lungs were destroyed. And the second was a young mother. You can see her in the lower left picture. And uh, she also died um, as a subject in early gene therapy trials. Neither of them were, you know, sort of late stage cancer people. They were people in relatively good health. The point being that a lack of engagement with risk in this instance actually triggered very strong reactions and doing work on gene therapy became hard to do. In fact, the U.S. lagged behind the rest of the world for a while because of the reactions to, let's call it, difficulty managing the risks in early stage trials. The off-target effects and mutations were bad. And now, of course, it's much more accepted, and we have all kinds of gene therapies under development. Somatic cell gene therapies, broadly accepted, approaches to their management that make sense uh, in terms of FDA, PMDA, and EMA. And we also have advances in regenerative medicines, the idea of either replacing tissue or regenerating tissue. And this is an area where Japan is a technological and scientific leader. And Japan is also a leader in terms of the approach to regulation of risk in this area. Uh, PMDA has come up with something called conditional time-limited authorization, which is an explicitly adaptive approach to managing the risks associated with regenerative medicines. And uh, worked on an article um, with colleagues in government in Europe, in the US, and in Japan on pharmaceuticals and licensing reimbursement using adaptive strategies. Uh, but again, nothing comes without criticism. Uh, I actually very much like what PMDA has been doing in this area, um, rebalancing evidence and learning from experience, but criticism does materialize. And in Nature, for example, there was a piece that was arguing that the system of regulation of stem cells uh, and modificate, modified stem cells in Japan uh, was too lax. I actually disagree with that piece. But again, anytime that you're modifying and coming up with more creative approaches to risk management, uh, you can expect criticism. Um, talking about more radical approaches, human germline gene therapies attract much more attention and criticism than the previous approaches. Uh, we've all heard of the uh, scientists in China uh, and the CRISPR babies, but the idea of editing the genes of uh, embryos and then growing the embryos with the results passing on to their uh, uh, successive generations. The issues that are raised are complex. The possibility here is frankly of editing humanity, doing therapeutics, and there are great examples of that right now in the United States. Um, addressing sickle cell anemia, for example. But there is also a call for approaches to do enhancements. We're sitting in the middle of the Winter Olympics, and you can imagine uh, certain national teams proceeding to be growing athletes with those attributes in the upper corner. Um, and you can imagine militaries wanting mil-spec enhancements, including pain thresholds and uh, parallel processing and courage and maybe even positive own group affect and negative out group affect. Risk here goes beyond simple appraisals of environment. 
and health. We're talking here about ethical issues and a need for discussions in advance on what would constitute appropriate and inappropriate applications of the technologies. Now let's end on environment. And I'm gonna end with a controversial example, uh, gene drives. Um, and way back, uh, several years ago, uh, my colleagues and I published a piece on regulating gene drives uh, in science. What's a gene drive? Mendelian inheritance, 50% odds of any alteration passing to the next generation. And then if it's fit, if there's a reproductive edge, it will propagate. A gene drive uses CRISPR and uses CRISPR to introduce gene editing machinery into organisms so that the odds of an alteration passing on are not 50-50, but are more like 99.5. This gives you the potential for editing whole populations even without introducing a fitness or reproductive edge. And the applications would include controlling invasive species or even spreading herbicide resistance uh, in populations of plants or controlling vector-borne diseases. And this is the most interesting one, eradicating or modifying vectors like mosquitoes so that they don't carry malaria. And the difference is encapsulated in the diagram at the bottom. Mendelian inheritance, you'll see an alteration at the top does not spread through the population. With gene drives, it spreads dramatically through populations, much greater penetration. Now, what are the issues? You worry about environmental effects, obviously, if this does and will go out. Unlike traditional biological engineering applications, you can count on there being potentially significant penetration of wild populations with significant environmental effects. And there's security issues as well. Uh, Professor Shirayama mentioned that. And in this case, you can imagine applications of gene drives to suppress crops or sp suppress pollinators uh, or potentially even to be used for blackmail. So in this instance, back to public-private partnerships, the private researchers doing the work, the scientists, the geeks, if you will, have acted reasonably responsibly. They've been adopting codes of conduct on what would constitute safe research. And the codes of conduct are actually quite specific and are broadly accepted and being followed. We also have, of course, intense debate in civil society, academics, governments, and NGOs are all fighting over these issues. And the only gap in the list of meetings on this topic occurred during COVID. Um, you know, we'll be seeing what happens now, uh, but things pause for a bit. But intense discussion. Typically, biological engineering applications do not have severe environmental effects, but here there is potential for significant environmental disruption. And frankly, the international mechanisms for governance are not up to the task. At this point, what we have is stalemate and controversy uh, and a lot of mistrust. Now, I wanna end on a closing puzzle, a conundrum, a difficult problem. And here's the problem. So information, information should be shared and it has to be shared if science is to advance. It has to be shared if you're gonna be validating work. That's obvious and basic and, and a universally agreed upon principle, a universally agreed upon principle in science. Information also needs to be shared with biosecurity people and biosafety officers and others. If you're gonna be managing risks effectively, the people that are gonna be managing the risks have to know what's going on. Now, the problem, is that information should not be shared with malevolent actors or negligent actors, actors that might deliberately or accidentally come up with harmful applications. And because compartmentalization of information is difficult or impossible, we're left with a problem. And the problem is that you both need to share with some, but you don't wanna share with others. And it's hard, in fact, maybe impossible to segment audiences to that degree. To what extent do we need to worry about this in information technology and in biotechnology? And the answer is we do. Some recent examples, a past one, uh, way, way, way back, like not quite 10 years ago, we had research taking place 
on the creation of mammal-to-mammal -mammal transmissible strains of avian influenza. And you can see the photograph in the upper right, a responsible scientist, Kaoka at the University of Wisconsin, and another scientist, uh, Fouché from Erasmus, and they were doing research on gain of function. Kawaoka used a weakened backbone so that if there was release after succeeding, the results would not be catastrophic. Fouché was using simple directed evolution on ferrets, and he was working with a full strength strain. Both succeeded in creating mammal to mammal transmissible strains that greatly increases the risk and at the same time, the discussion of whether this should be done and how it should be managed took place after the experiments were complete. The discussions have to play, take place in the beginning, but discussions of the research also pose risks in and of themselves, particularly the Fouché work, which could be re reproduced by others. Now, here are some recent examples from, um, well, from 2018 and 2021, the bottom one, is the reconstruction of horsepox from synthesized fragments. And the person did that work at very low cost in a short period of time. And if you can do it with horsepox, you can do it with smallpox. The PLS biology one at the top is a toolkit. And it's a toolkit for creating COVID-19 variants. How to. Useful to scientists, for sure and at the same time, potentially dangerous if in the wrong hands. The problem that we have because of this, unless if you can figure out a way of compartmentalizing information, technologists themselves have a heightened duty to engage with the risks of their own work. With information hazards, this is even more critical than usual. And the proposition I would raise is that the technological geeks and the science nerds have an obligation, have an obligation to evaluate what they're doing with reference to legal standards and ethical norms, to certainly align their own work with laws and norms based on existing knowledge and to encourage others to do the same, but also to actively identify gaps in knowledge and fill the gaps through research, and to be good citizens, identifying gaps in legal coverage and joining in debates on those gaps. And the problem is that they have to do it early to allow time, to allow time to modify their work, to allow time to organize others, to allow time to initiate research on benefit and risk, and to allow time to evaluate and influence policy. So let me end on that note uh, and I guess turn it back to Professor Shirayama. Uh, thank you all. Very much, Professor Oye for giving us a comprehensive picture of the risk governance and uh, also focusing on the uh, dilemma relating to the information use uh, between the security and the safety area. And also you touch upon the role of the scientists in the process. That's also relating to the issue of the role of the private actor in the governance process, So, which will be dealt with in the second session. Thank you very much for your uh, speech. Now we'd like to turn to the, the Japanese side and we'd like, I'd like to ask the, uh, Professor Matsuo uh, to give us your talk. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity and thank you very much, uh, Oi-sensei. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. Wow, um, it was um, fantastic. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so um, in this presentation, I would like to present what will be the major governance issue for the reconstruction of science technology policy system that deserves to be considered in the coming two years of our project. Uh, we will present general points and issues, but also drawing on a particular example from the area of biotechnology and AI as needed. And so um, there is an increasing importance of science technology as we face the so-called grand challenges. Such grand challenges include climate change and pandemic, and here the science and technology plays a great role for solution. Meanwhile, we are living in an era where new technologies such as AI, IoT, is, and as uh, Oi-sensei has mentioned, uh, biotechnology are advancing in unprecedented speed. 
which is causing the broad, ambiguous, and certain social impact nationally and globally, making the science technology issue more complex, interrelated, and systemic. Also, social demand are on the rise for accountability and consideration of LC is important. And um, there is an increase in recognition of innovation when promoting science technology. As such, uh, science technology's promotion must be balanced with the social implication. And the question is, does the current science technology innovation policy equip with the capacity to respond well in this rapidly changing environment? We consider there are limitations in science technology innovation governance capacity, as we found three deficits in current governance structure. First, um, the current science technology governance is short-sighted. It focuses on immediate short-term um, short interests and evident risks. Second, uh, it is siloed. Sectionalism is prevalent. There is a lack of coordination with different fields, sector in pursuit of partial optimization. Third, it is fixed. Institutions are strongly built in a past-dependent manner and are difficult to respond to change. Those, ki uh, those kind of characteristic of current science technology governance may work efficiently for the issues that we have, uh, we have limited impact in no one, but not for the most issues we are facing today. These deficits arising from the nature of science technology innovation policy can be seen in how the technology is being developed and introduced to society. Different policy actors in different, uh, different sectors are in charge of basic research, applied research, and social introduction. And there is no seamless flow from basic to social introduction. For example, in the case of biotechnology, there are many technology developed, namely the genome editing and synthetic biology, as already mentioned by Oi Sensei. And those new technologies sometimes pose challenges for existing regulation, safety assessment, and many countries are struggling with these issues. The ministries and agency in charge of promotion of basic research have, to have the uh, knowledge of technology and the possible application at the early stage, but they rarely consider social impact with ministries in charge of regulatory oversight. If this information uh, at the uh, earlier stage is shared and work together um, with the uh, regulatory oversight body at the latter stage, then it will be easier for the regulatory oversight body to keep pace with the technological development. Other issue is that funding agency and ministry promoting R&D also differ. For example, uh, for the agriculture, Ministry of Agriculture, for industry use, uh, Ministry of um, Economy and Trade, and for medical use, Ministry of Health. And those have less connection with ministry, primarily in charge of uh, the basic research, the Ministry of Education. And the research of basic research, uh, the result of basic research are not passed on, nor is a feedback from applied research to basic research. And the establishment of Jap uh, the Japan Agency for Medical Research and Development, EMED, uh, in medical field in 2015 can be said as a response to this issue of fragmentation in the process of actors. Uh, uh, and um, it aims to provide seamless funding from basic research to practical application and clinical studies trial and integrate all the medical related R&D under this institution. And because of this, the situation may be changing, but for other areas, the issue still remains. And the same can be said to the tools in policy process. There are many useful approaches, horizon scanning, foresight, technology assessment, risk approach, regulatory gap analysis, regulatory impact assessment. <coughs> but these issues is all done in an isolated manner. Depending on the degree of social adoption of science and technology, and also the policy objective of tools for policy uh, process may differ. In early stage of technology, it is important to collect a wide range of information on potential technology by horizon scanning and engaging foresight activity to formulate long-term vision 20 to 30 years ahead. When technology is certain to be introduced into society uh, within like five, 10 years, 
it is necessary to conduct TA, the so-called TA technology assessment, uh, in order to consider its social impact and LC. Further, when the technology is ready to be introduced to the society, it is necessary to develop specific measures to manage safety. Here, the risk approach is useful. We also need to conduct a regulatory gap analysis uh, to see whether the existing framework can cover the risk and also consider whether the impact of measure taken is proper enough. So for that, we need to do the regulatory impact assessment. And emerging technologies must be positioned in the context of society and take into account values, LC, ethical, legal, social issues that may arise rather than just simply focusing on the uh, research and development of technology. And lessons from the technology and pro products from each of those activities must be shared and handed over throughout the policy process. However, this is not the case. And if we think about the current policy related to biotechnology in Japan, um, biotech strategy is developed at the uh, control, uh, uh, Council for Science, Technology, Innovation, which is uh, situated in the cabinet office. And this uh, SISTI, the so-called SISTI, uh, plays the role of overall coordination and command tower. And there are some sort of uh, horizon scanning and foresight activities are carried out by um, funding agencies and research and development agencies of the ministries. But those activities are more technology focused and limited to each ministry's scope. And the, uh, the result of activity is not shared among the uh, funding agency or re research and development agency in different sectors. Further, the risk management body in charge of oversight do not have a clear connection with those activities, which is, again, making them difficult to consider measures in advance. And in Japan, the technology assessment body is not, uh, not situated. So um, there is no comprehensive, um, there is no way for Japan to uh, consider the comprehensive social impact of technology. So my hope here is to make the policy and governance structure seamlessly connected. So, what is needed to fix our policy, institution, and governance? Um, for the short-sighted, for overcoming the short-sighted, we need to introduce a long-term forward-looking approach. For overcoming the siloed, we need to set in place a meta-holistic whole-of-government approach. For fixing the fixed, uh, we need to bring in flexible, responsive approach. And in the following slide, I will elaborate more on this, but we need to keep in mind that there is no perfect approach because every approach can have merit and demerit. So first, I would like to, um, uh, to I, will, I, I would argue that uh, we need to um, introduce a mechanism in the policy process to form a long, uh, long vision in priority issue domains. For that, it is indispensable to promote collaboration between existing foresight and horizon scanning activities. Um, actually, we do have foresight and horizon scanning, but the problem here is that there is no interaction among them which makes links between basic applied research, uh, basic and applied research disconnected. We need to promote collaboration and exchange of information between existing foresight and horizon scanning activities, like that of the NYSTEP or the Met, uh, uh, NED, NEDO at METI. We also need to seamlessly connect long-term vision, foresight, and social implication. Particularly, we need to consider institutional design that seamlessly connect uh, research and development to implementation, including the oversight and regulation, in order to make sure to consider safety, regulatory science, and LC from the outset. We need to, we need to also embed the so-called RRI, research, uh, responsible research and innovation, from the early stage, together with the researchers and development to avoid pacing problem, where the te 
technology development outpace the regulatory oversight. The other point I would like to make in the context of Japan is that the uh, lack of long-term perspective in policymaking may due to the Japanese bureaucratic system, uh, which aimed to raise in generalist rather than the specialist. Secondly, in response to uh, sort of a sectionalism, uh, we need to introduce a holistic mechanism that allows to see the whole picture in policy issues. This requires, first of all, a holistic meta approach in policy uh, issues. We need to do the analysis of in interrelatedness or trade-offs or synergies. And this is um, easy said than done. For example, uh, biostrategy, uh, in Japan we have biostrategy, and this biostrategy aims to realize bioeconomy society by 2030. There are indeed uh, different views for bioeconomy. Uh, bio some consider from biotechnology, some consider it from bioresource vision, and some uh, why others consider it from bioecology vision. And the strategy has to, has to be aligned in a way that accommodates all these perspectives uh, and having relevant actors. But this could be a very difficult task. The importance of uh, cross-sector jurisdiction had always been acknowledged, and the solution for this was to establish a coordination and command tower at the cabinet office. But now the cabinet office is um, crowded with many control towers, and there might be a need to reconsider the coordination and control tower function within the cabinet office. Next, uh, we need to um, uh, have a multi-level perspective uh, which is argued in transition management theory. Uh, we need to consider the overall trends, uh, landscape, changing environment, international relations, and niche in addition to policy support. Finally, we need to consider the approach that enables flexibility and responsiveness in, in, in responding to uncertainty. Here, I'd like to ask a question. So, as um, was mentioned um, by all these senses as well, but um, there are uh, concepts and ideas that uh, the planned adaptive governance or agile governance or reflexive governance or experimentation, those concepts are becoming popular, but can we learn lessons from this? And the, for example, the concept of agility is appealing in the face of unchanging inflexibility and rigidity. But how can we exactly utilize this concept in real policy? What needs to be taken care of in using it? For example, the concept of agility is, um, can be said like inherently and conceptually have conflict with stability. I also think that there is a need for information and evidence gathering mechanism. Because in order to make a change or rule, new information and evidence is needed. But uh, the difficult, uh, it, it will be difficult in the emergent technology since there is no uh, routine mechanism to collect or gather information. So what kind of mechanism can be considered? Public-private partnership or uh, voluntary consultation? <coughs> and here, I'd like to mention a bit about the example of notification procedure for genome-edited food in Japan as it could be said as a way to keep pace with technology. Japan clarified regulatory status of genome edited food uh, for food use in 2090. As a result, certain genome edited product, uh, which considered to pose the same level of risk, was exempted from the genetically modified uh, regulation. As a result, uh, uh, regulation, so, but however, the, at the same time, Ministry of Health set in place a mechanism to ensure the prior consultation to accumulate information and monitor and for consumer confidence. And information and product not under the regulation also made available to public. Furthermore, labeling is not mandatory, but consumer agency encouraged developers to provide information on notified products. I think no other countries take such approach for labeling for exempted product. The interesting thing about this is that other countries taking the same scope exemption, not necessarily collecting, or, e uh, or even if they collect, do not make 
make it open to public. So uh, this might be uh, some example. And finally, um, I would like to finish my presentation by asking what would be the role for policy maker in SDI, science, technology, innovation? Making strategy, rule not making, multi-level policy coordination and process management, new leadership and matching function. And that's it for me, and uh, uh, if Shiroyama wants to um, add in addition to that. Yeah, th th thank you very much, Matsuo-san. And uh, I just give, like to give a few words relating to this final slide. And uh, Matsuo-san talked about the basic issue, especially focusing on the three point, the long-term perspective and holistic perspective and agile, responsive issue, mainly using about the case of the biotechnology and the gene editing. And maybe the similar cases are dealt with by Professor Oe. And uh, I just give a, a, this slide and uh, for the purpose that, you know, we have a similar kind of issue relating to the artificial intelligence. Uh, I just would like to emphasize three points that the AI also touch upon the various type of the risks, the safety risk and the security risk and the ethics and the privacy and so on. So the broader issue have to be dealt with. And what's interesting about the AI in Japan was that we have been working on the technology assessment issue in Japan for a while, but uh, there is no formal mechanism. But concerning the AI, there seems to be the de facto uh, technology assessment at the various of the venue, but it's not necessarily integrated enough. But, but still, the very interesting experiment in the Japanese context. And uh, finally, the issue might be relating to the agile and the responsive issue. And uh, in the name of the agile, uh, in the Japanese context, you know, there are many emphasis on the, 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 the soft law approach or the flexible approach. But just soft law is enough for the agile, you know, it's just the repetition of the traditional way of the soft control. And that, that seems to be an issue. And in some cases, uh, some modification of the hard law might be needed. And uh, that issue will be dealt with uh, by the Kurokawa-san uh, at the, the final uh, presentation. And that's also relating to the, the issue of the uh, regulatory reform relating to the regenerative medicine mentioned by the uh, Professor Oe. So, so the balance between the soft law and hard law, the very classical issue, but uh, that's also might be important. Okay, so thank you very much, Matsuo-san, for, for, for sharing with us a very important broad perspective and using the concrete cases. Okay, so we are running a little bit late, but uh, we'd like Sorry, to move I to the... Too much. <laughs> we'd like to move to the, the, the discussion session first. And uh, in the discussion session, uh, we'd like to ask first uh, the our team member uh, to comment from the different perspectives. So, Maybe first, uh, Professor Suzuki. Uh, he has been working on the interface between the security and the science technology in a project, and maybe relating to that sure. prospect. Please. Sure. Um, thank you very much, uh, Shiro Mensen. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Owe and uh, Professor Matsuo, for our two excellent presentations for on the uh, on the various issues with regard to the uh, question of the reg regulations and uh, and innovation. And I think um, two. Uh, distinctive uh, presentation have covered the sort of, I think it's complementary. Uh, on the one hand, the Professor Oe has, uh, has focused on how the researchers and the, you know, the, the geeks um, should behave and uh, how to maintain the research integrity. While um, Matsu, Professor Matsuo has, um, has mentioned about the, um, the role of government and how regulatory framework will control over the, um, o over the process of the, uh, uh, of the, um, uh, uh, innovation, uh, the innovation process. The, what is, I think, interesting is that the, there is a missing piece in, in these two um, presentation, which is about the question of the security. Um, since the, I, I think uh, Professor Oe has mentioned about the uh, malign use of the technology. I mean, the, the question of the biotechnology can be easily used for the um, classic uh, uh, bio, uh, bio weapon, and which is banned by the um, convention, um, 
covenant of the uh, uh, bio -wep uh, biological weapons, but also the, the new gene editing technology and, uh, and, and various other uh, uh, technology with regard to the CRISPR, and I think uh, Professor Owe has, um, uh, has uh, spotted, spotted um, the horsebox uh, case, which eventually had, uh, had controlled by, uh, there, there was an intervention by the, the Department of Defense uh, because of the uh, security implications. And I think in, in, in case of Japan, that sort of um, uh, security-related intervention doesn't exist. Um, Ministry of Defense doesn't have a capability of uh, of doing this uh, horizon search, and you know uh, there, there is no horizon scanning, and they they were not invested heavily uh, into understanding the um, the the emerging technology, and I think this is a missing piece of the uh, current regulatory framework. So when we talk about the holistic approach, the holistic approach needs to include such. Uh, um, uh, 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 security aspects, and I think there has to be a responsible uh, government competence needs to be set for uh, looking uh, from the uh, security angle uh, and to have the sort of horizon scanning on what's going on in the research field. But unfortunately, for the long, the, the, long after the World War II, Japan has a, a sort of a distinctively separated the uh, academic work and the security work. And because of the uh, uh, experience uh, and, the, and the regrets on, the, on what happened during the World War II, um, the, there is a sort of a big barrier between the academics and, and the security side. And mostly because the academics don't want to engage into the security, uh, security activities, but also on, from the security and the defense side are, are being stayed away from the uh, interaction with the academics. And I think that's, that creates a certain risk of the uh, erosion of the, uh, of the technology. And I think this is one of the reasons why the, there is a big discussion about the economic security today. There is a new proposed bill for the promotion of the security, uh, economic security, and which includes the um, <coughs> classified um, patent uh, system, uh, which is generally considered that the, uh, the patent was open to public, therefore the technology can be, uh, uh, can be uh, transferred through this open uh, patent system. And also there are a number of the uh, uh, measures taken to, to limit the uh, transfer of technology. So my, my comments are on, on this uh, security aspect and perhaps this directs to the Professor Matsuo and how, what is the potential engagement on this and how do you assess the new proposed bill on the economic security? Uh, w w would it change the directions? And the second question, uh, perhaps, is to uh, Professor Owe, is that yes, it's uh, it's very interesting. The uh, this information sharing information has the contradictory nature, and I think uh, so. Just simply asking, I know this is a corundum, but um, simply asking, what shall we do? Um, do we need to open the information or not? And to what extent? How? What is the possibility to limit the sharing information to the certain community and not, not passing on to the other communities, which may include the um, hostile, malign um, actors? So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Suzuki. So. First, uh, Professor Matsuo, about uh, the possible governance structure for the security okay, risk in the Japanese context. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this um, important uh, point that you have raised. Um, yes, indeed, uh, we don't have the security aspect in, uh, uh, in the promotion of technology. And if you look at the bioeconomy strategy, a biotech 
uh, bi bio strategy of Japan, um, there is almost no mention about security. And um, so, but as you mentioned, suddenly we need to consider the economic security. Um, the people in this community is beginning to be aware of, uh, you know, we have to consider secu security. And so now it's taking place. And so I think it does this. So, at, so the trend at the landscape level, if you look at a multi-level perspective, in, in a multi-level perspective, right, um, the the influence that or the trend that's um, being uh, developed is really affecting the policy uh, at the policy level and um, yeah this is uh, very much uh, different from the um, the I, I would like to ask uh, Oi sensei too but um, uh, I think in, uh, in the US um, biotechnology almost always uh, entail biosecurity. They are promoted or discussed all together, for the, for especially for the synthetic biology. Um, from the outset, they are always thinking about biosecurity issues. But in Japan, I think that's absent. So I think we need to um, consider that. And thank you very much for your point. Yeah, thank you very much, Matsuo-sensei. Yeah, I'd like to ask the Professor Oe to respond about the dilemma of the sharing information and how to deal with that. And also, I'm curious and interesting about you know what determines the effectiveness of the kind of the self-regulation by the geeks and the researchers. The training is okay. important, and <laughs> yeah, those are the kind so, of the uh, stuff. Yeah, please. Okay, so let me try to answer. Not answer. Let me try to try to begin to answer uh, three questions that have been posed. Um, let's actually start with a question that came from Professor Matsuo. You mentioned that Japan was short of people in government with the scientific training. You said that there are a bunch of generalists running around and that if you're gonna be talking about actually managing to pull off adaptive risk governance, you need technical skills. Let me suggest that you begin by going to the cabinet office and finding Mori Yusuko, Yusuke. Okay, now he's a guy who came to MIT. I know him from his, his time there, but he has biological training. He worked in the cabinet office on coming up with methods of governing biological risks and is now off, I think, on some assignment in Chiba Prefecture. Um, uh, let me, let me inter <laughs> interview. I, I actually asked Mori san to come to join this. Um, meeting, but he wasn't available today. Uh, he is now at the Tsukubashi. Uh, and uh, oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. <laughs> okay. But I'm mentioning him and I'm mentioning Dr. Sato at PMDA as people with a combination of exceptional sense in terms of policy, but also deep understandings of the medicine in Sato-san's case and uh, biology in terms of Mori's case. And I would pose the questions to them because they actually are sitting there and doing the policies, trying to install more adaptive approaches, um, but with good understanding of the technical issues that are involved. Now, I wanna also then pick up on Professor Suzuki's question, uh, his unfair question, <laughs> what do you wanna do Sorry. about information hazards? <laughs> and okay, I wanna tell you, I'm working on a paper on that right now. And I'm working on it with a bunch of friends who disagree over the issues. Some of the scientists are saying that the appropriate answer, response or answer is don't restrict. I have other scientists that are saying, let me tell you, there are things I can do with biology that would curl your hair and we're really in danger. And he actually views it as an issue of existential risk. We have biosafety officers uh, the president of ABSA International, who are also co-authors, and their intense concern is how are they, as biosafety people, to obtain the information that they need to keep people safe, okay? And then we have hardcore security people whose names I'm not allowed to mention, who believe that the way to handle all of this is to classify everything, but you can't. It doesn't work that way. They don't have that kind of control over the information. 
so other people that I work with are cryptographers who are trying to use cryptography to, to limit in very, very significantly who has access to the information. So what I propose, Suzuki-san, is that we put our heads together and talk about this more. It's not that there's an easy answer sitting there right now. Just as there is no easy answer to the question that you raised on patent secrecy orders, where inventions may be impounded. A final note, you observe that Japan is less concerned about security than the United States, and that's certainly true. But there is more going on in the realm of sharing information quietly amongst people working on biosecurity issues and negligence biosafety issues than is commonly understood. I was invited to give a talk on gene drives by a group I'd never heard of, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and the group consisted of a group of regulators from Europe, Japan, China, India, who meet quietly, almost unofficially, to share information on emerging risks, to share information on monitoring, to share information on how to run the Australia group. It's called IEGPER. And it's always alarming when you're invited to give a speech and meet a bunch of regulators and you've never heard of the group. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the International Experts Group on Biosafety and Biosecurity Regulation. So there's a little bit more going on in this space than I think is commonly realized. Uh, the problem, of course, is that the people that are quiet want to remain quiet. <laughs> and I'm not even sure I should write about them. But, <laughs> but very, very good comments from all. And I, I'm going to stop now. I've gone on way too long. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Oe. Okay, so now I'd like to turn to Professor Kishimoto uh, to give us some comments or questions. Okay. okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Oyan Matsu-san, uh, for stimulating presentations. I will comment on two points that came to mind inspired by your presentations, not direct questions and comments. One is about the uh, policymakers culture, the other is framing of the discussion of governance. Okay, so the, uh, the first point is about the administrative policymakers culture that prevents proactive responses to issues. Even if horizon scanning is performed and the issues are identified in advance, there is one factor, I think, that prevents us from addressing them. One phrase is shared among policymakers in Japan, a concept called Bippo Jijitsu in Japanese, which means the facts which trigger or justify developing new laws and regulations. It is usually used Lipo digits has occurred, or there is no lipo digits yet, or something like that. It is my view that this concept is likely to prevent us from taking proactive measures because this concept has been interpreted and operated in a very narrow sense, such as uh, something actually happened. In other words, legal and regulatory responses cannot be taken until a real accident happens. I think it's an ethical attitude. This culture is deeply rooted in Japanese policymakers and does not appear to have changed even after Fukushima nuclear power accident. As long as we live in a society where the speed of technological innovation is faster than the speed of revision of laws and regulations. This culture needs to be changed as soon as possible. Okay, that's it for the first part. The, my second point is on the issue of framing of the discussion of governance of emerging technologies. There are two opposite ways in which emerging technologies are discussed. Technology-oriented 
and issue oriented. The technology assessments are usually conducted, conducted with a specific technology in mind. I think it is a former technology oriented, technology based. The other approach is to first list the issues that need to be solved in society, such as SDGs, and then describe a technology as one of the ways to solve the issues. In the middle of the two, there are ways to describe the specific technologies as important components of the ideal image of society, such as Society 5.0, which the Japanese government is promoting, or smart cities or bioeconomy. As uh, SDGs are a good example, there seems to be a shift from technology-based to issue-based recently. If there is a shift from a technology-based to uh, issue-based, many things will change. Many things have to be changed. So we have to reconstruct science and technology policy comprehensively. This also depends on whose perspective we, are, we consider. Researchers usually have specific technologies, but uh, citizen perspective, from, from a citizen perspective, it doesn't matter what the means or technologies are, as long as the problem is solved. It doesn't matter if science and technologies are not employed at all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kishimoto. Uh, maybe the two questions are important. The first one is the issue of the culture. And uh, maybe that's also related to the issue of the, the, the security or the other uh, the policy area. In the security, there are many discussions about the scenario or the preventive action or, you know, the, just like uh, U.S. action to the uh, Iraq <laughs> relating to the <laughs> war, war, war at the beginning of this century. So anyway, the culture issue, that's important. And the second issue might be that that's also the big issue in the science and technology governance issue, especially in Japan science technology per se to science and technology for solving the societal issues. But what does it really mean? And is it really followed and implemented? You know, those are the big questions. I think I first asked the Matsu uh, sensei I to respond. I think Oi sensei is raising Oh, hands. OK. So the first, uh, Professor Oe, can I give us some response? Sure. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Kishimoto sensei. You raised a question on lessons of Fukushima and then moved into making the point on citizens' perspectives and the need for public engagement. I wanna actually go back to the Fukushima crisis with an example. It's also an example of the quality of geeks in Japanese bureaucracies. In the midst of that crisis, um, the vice chair of the Japan Atomic Energy Commission, uh, who was a nuclear engineer from MIT, uh, Suzuki uh, Tatsujiro did something very unusual. He actually went on social media and answered questions, provided his best take in addressing questions, would even say he didn't know at times, and was not behaving typically in terms of having his responses carefully vetted. He responded. And I'm mentioning this because it's quite unusual in Japan to have unfiltered bureaucrats offering information in the midst of crisis, particularly crises that cut to the core of legitimacy as significantly as that one, and to be communicating directly through social media. I'm not sure that's a good model. Suzuki Tatsujiro is an unusual person with good judgment and technical skill and grace, but it's a it's Something to think about as we consider ways of being creative on risk governance and risk communication 
particularly where we have controversial emerging technologies, technologies that are not accepted, but where acceptance and questioning is, is part of the process that is going on. Okay, so thank you very much. So then I'd like to turn to the Matsuo Sensei. Okay, um, I, I will be brief. Um, I think um, the point that you have raised in terms of framing is very important. Um, and uh, whether the technology, uh, so there are two ways of um, uh, approaching and technology oriented or issue oriented. And both I think is cross cutting. Technology oriented is all, all, also cross cutting. Issue oriented is also cross cutting. And so whether you take either uh, approach you take, it's already cross cutting. But if you move more to the issue oriented, it needs more and more network. So um, yeah, um, that that's something that we need to consider how how to overcome sectionalism and um, being connected in a certain uh, policy area uh, issue area or certain policy technology area. And it, uh, currently it's all isolated uh, in a way. So how to bring together those kind of um, uh, uh, thing at a place, uh, that function we need to really consider. Thank you. Oh, okay. And uh, Shiroyama Sensei allowed me to ask my question. <laughs> I really wanted to ask one question to Oi Sensei. Um, may I, Oi Sensei? <laughs> uh, I was impressed okay. by um, your presentation. Uh, I'm always impressed by your presentation, but um, I was mostly impressed by the story that you you talked in your presentation. That um, you know when when the, there was a researcher who came up with the idea of home brewing opiates, uh, they asked you for advice, right? And um, that's fantastic, I think. Um, there are, so they know who to ask, and there is someone like you. So um, I, I was wondering, in the US, how many people like you are there? <laughs> how to make someone like you? <laughs> and it's, so how exactly, uh, uh, what kind of mechanism do you need to have uh, to make another Oi Sensei? <laughs> That's my question. <laughs> okay, forget about making uh, other Oi Sensei in the context of genetic engineering. <laughs> that question is uh, too tricky. But let me give a little background on how that interaction came to be. So this guy was a guy named John Duber, and he was a professor at uh, University of California, Berkeley, a biological engineer. We knew each other because we were both part of a National Science Foundation Synthetic Biology Engineering Research Center. And that center included both engineering geeks and policy wonks, people like me. Um, some of the people that were in the science, in the social sciences were not interested in policy, were anthropologists interested in diagnostics and others were policy people. Now, it is unusual for NSF, at least at that time, to provide the funding, putting together a mixture of people with doing, if you will, the technology and people working on policy in the same areas. Um, and it was controversial. They did it because they were expecting that reactions to synthetic biology were gonna be significant in terms of limiting acceptance of the technology. And put less politely, they were interested in covering themselves against criticism by proceeding without risk and risk management built in. This happened in year six of an enterprise after I had been going to many, many, many meetings. But the meetings had also yielded other activities in collaboration with the biologists and biological engineers. The gene drive project that I mentioned was something that had come about just before then and the publication in Science was something which Duber had seen. Now, the question, how do you create collaborations of that sort? And I have to tell you, I was very happy when he approached me, okay? But 
the way that it works, I think, is that the National Science Foundations and the Nettos and the other organizations that are known largely for their work in science and technology have to set aside a little bit of money and attention, more significantly, actually, it's almost the attention, to thinking ahead and getting people into the room together. And I like this better, frankly, than receiving funds to be working independently. There was a big fight within NSF. Should they be supporting work on science policy by creating institutes that are focused on the social sciences or to do it in integrated cross-sectoral enterprises? When NSF was supporting work on nanotechnologies, they actually had scientists working on nanotech, engineers working on nanotech, and then one center to work on environment and one center to work on STS issues. And there were good projects, but the projects I think did not benefit from that kind of interaction as much, I think, as would have been most desirable. The SDS activities were great SDS activities, but they weren't informed by that close collaboration with the scientists. And I could not have predicted at the start of my work with Sinberg, I could not have predicted what was going to happen and which activities would work out. I didn't know that George Church and Kevin Esfelt working on gene drives were going to step forward and say we ought to work together because we'd worked on other issues with other people before, or that Duber would come across with his weird opiates project. But again, there's synergism, there's serendipity, you don't know what's going to happen, but it's not going to happen unless the people are in proximity. And that's kind of the basic point. You know, I've already mentioned people in Japan like Mori-san and Suzuki-san. And again, they're really great collaborators. We've co-authored things, but again, but you need to know people. And how do you get to know people? You get to know them by working together or studying together. Um, I frankly have also benefited from being at MIT because people want to come and I meet people when they're visiting as well. But the answer to your story is that those providing the funding and setting up the research probably should be actively trying to promote collaborations and they don't have to be ritualistic, maybe even the, frankly, it's informal and unplanned that worked out the best of all. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Oe, for suggesting a very practical uh, issue. And maybe th those are the, those kind of the, how to say, the process itself might be a very interesting topic for uh, research. And actually, I, uh, we had the one question from Professor Arimoto of the Grips about the a big issue of the balancing between the basic research and technology policy. But uh, I think that this session, rather focusing on the relatively narrow area of the risk governance uh, among the, the, you know, the holistic coordination program. So the, the, the research policy, the basic research and technology policy issue maybe uh, will be dealt with in the second session's context. So I, I just uh, thank you very much for giving us a uh, uh, comment and we will consider that. But, uh, Maybe that will be third phase in the, the second session, I think. Okay, so th thank you very much for the active participation in the first session. So I'd like to close the first session here. So initially, we expect to have a 10 minutes break, but uh, sorry for that, but uh, it's a little bit late. So we'd like to begin after five minutes. So we will begin at uh, 11.30, uh, the second session. So please have a short break. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to begin the, the second session. The second session is about the role and the limitation of the private sector in innovation. So first, I'd like to ask Professor Dushibarie uh, to give us your talk, please. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Professor Shiloyama, for your invitation. And I would like also to thank, of course, the Tokyo Foundation for, for the organization of this uh, fascinating uh, webinar. 
So basically, the argument I would like to develop with you uh, this morning, or this evening for those who are a little far from us, is that, of course, the private sector plays a key role in innovation, but this role is not exclusive, and it's, it, this role should be also uh, counterbalanced by other, uh, other actors, including government, but also civil society. Let me uh, please allow me to, to start to setting the scene with a very brief uh, um, comparison between the situation in France and Japan regarding the flows of research and development uh, expenditures. And as you can see, so sorry, it's a little old data, but it did not change that much uh, during the last five years. Basically, what you see is that, yes, private sector is dominating uh, R&D expenditure. And this domination is even more visible in the case in Japan, both in terms of origin of uh, expenditure and in terms of destination. This is still very uh, important in the French context, but uh, a little less counterbalanced partly by uh, government as the origin and uh, universities as a destination. I, I could develop further to emphasize the importance of uh, large uh, companies in uh, uh, research and development expenditure in Japan. And to, I could also develop, and it can be done during the Q&A session, a kind of historical uh, comparative perspective between Japan and the US to uh, to emphasize the fact that uh, this situation is not new in Japan, but uh, so the domination of industries and big companies, but uh, this is partly uh, converging. Uh. So now uh, I hope my presentation will not be too much caricatural, but I would like to introduce what I would call a dominant view on innovation, and the rest of my talk after will be dedicated to a criticism uh, against this uh, dominant view. So what I call the dominant view is, has been deeply influenced by what happened in the US, especially uh, on, on the West Coast during the 80s and 90s, the so-called success of the uh, Silicon Valley model, especially in uh, information and te uh, communication technologies, and also in uh, biotech, as it has been reminded in the first part of this webinar. This uh, Silicon Valley model has been uh, simplified. Uh, uh, there are several theories to explain the success of uh, US companies in the field of innovation during these two uh, decades, and we are maybe uh, experiencing the, the continuation of this success. These models uh, emphasize the importance of entrepreneurship, venture capital, and also uh, collaboration between firms and universities. So this model this does not deny the importance of collaboration, of course, but emphasize very much the importance of private companies. And within these private companies, uh, it emphasizes the importance of a specific type, which is called uh, startups, and that has been at the center of the attention of all policymakers all over the world during the uh, last three decades, to, see, uh, to say the least, and with, I would say, uh, moderate successes in, in uh, countries uh, outside the US or specific cases like uh, Israel, for example. So according to this dominant view uh, regarding the process of innovation, France and Japan uh, should be considered uh, as laggards or not successful uh, innovation system because of backward uh, institution. The key element I will not enter here in, in the discussion is the lack of entrepreneurship, the low rate of startup creation. And the story ends here. We, we have uh, two countries, Japan and France, who are not innovative according to this definition of the Silicon Valley model. I would add that this perspective on innovation, the emphasis of the Silicon Valley model, is very much inspired 
by uh, what we may call a neo-Schumpeterian view on innovation that develop, which is known for the idea of creative uh, destruction, of course, but that develop uh, several other uh, hypotheses. For example, the idea that all social problems have technological solutions, that the private actors are the drivers of innovation, and that the role of the state should be limited to the definition of IPR and eventually infrastructure, including education. So I will now proceed in two steps. I will try to uh, convince you, uh, but I'm sure you are already convinced. It's just a confirmation. I will try to convince you uh, uh, that this view uh, uh, dominated by the Silicon Valley model is maybe not completely uh, misleading, but it's certainly not as general as it pretends to be. And in the second step, I will uh, go a little for further and maybe uh, enter into a uh, um, discussion on the role of social innovation that should force us maybe also to change our definition of uh, what innovation is. So uh, I will now develop what I believe uh, that are four limitations of this previous dominant view that I describe, uh, that I described previously. I put aside the uh, analysis of what is really the Silicon Valley model. I think there are people here on site and online that are much more competent than me to describe what was really the Silicon Valley model and uh, what uh, the, the role of startup has been by comparison to the role of government and other players. So I will introduce uh, four uh, limitations and then maybe propose you uh, uh, alternative framework. So the first uh, limitation is not the fact that this dominant view of innovation is denying the importance of collaboration. I mentioned that it's uh, uh, also uh, considered by this view, but I think it's largely uh, underestimated and research on innovation during the last two or three decades have emphasized that the reality that collaboration is at really at the center of the very process of innovation. I cite a fam famous paper here by Hagedorn uh, describing the rise, the rise of uh, R&D partnership. Uh, I'm citing also a, a second famous paper by Block and Keller from UC Davis, showing, looking at the 100 top innovation every year from the early uh, 70s, and showing that uh, the, the, the share of collaboration is, uh, collaborative innovation is uh, dominant and is increasing over time, especially uh, from the uh, late 80s. And within this collaboration, if you decompose the collaboration, you see that public support is dominating. Uh, so we, we should consider the importance of collaboration and the role of public organization in this process. The second uh, uh, criticism, which is, uh, again, not the most uh, radical criticism, is about uh, increasing science linkages. Of course, uh, in the model, in the Silicon Valley model, we, as I mentioned, emphasize the importance of uh, collaboration between universities and private sectors. But uh, again, my point is it should be really central. And we, one indicator is that the, the number of citations of scientific papers by pat patents has uh, increased globally, but maybe not equally in all countries and not equally, of course, in all sectors, of course, but it's very important in, in the US and we should draw conclusion on the importance of this increasing uh, science linkages. We, if it's less uh, important in Japan, you nonetheless see through this uh, figure that uh, the uh, patent number, number of patent applications by universities in Japan has uh, uh, grown dramatically from the early uh, 2000s. Uh, 
Uh, third, uh, third point is about uh, the role of government in industrial and innovation policies. Here, I would like to emphasize a paradox, and I, I, I will strictly focus uh, briefly on the case of uh, the European Union that has defined uh, more than one decade ago, uh, ago uh, new innovation union strategy with a key role for, uh, of course, uh, government of uh, member states, but also a key role of the European Union, the European Commission uh, itself. And this strategy emphasizes uh, the role of uh, all types of innovation, including uh, social and uh, in social innovation and innovation from the public uh, sector. Uh, the EU has also uh, created the European Innovation uh, Council, whose goal is certainly to promote startups, but that goes much beyond the promotion of, of startups. The paradox here is that this EU strategy is very much influenced by the past Japanese experience. It seems that in this country, Japan, uh, there is a tendency to forget what was at the origin of the strengths of the Japanese innovation system, uh, and it has been analyzed and uh, imitated in Europe while uh, the Japanese uh, government were about to forget and to uh, give up uh, the importance of government coordination. Uh, uh, of course, a famous example is the importance of uh, uh, research and development consortia. That was, in my view, uh, a key element of uh, innovation process in Japan. It has been imitated in Europe, and I can uh, uh, bet that it will be more and more important in the future. I would like to go back uh, to the Japanese uh, model of innovation and make two points. First, uh, what is uh, clear is that Japanese companies, uh, especially since the 90s, have engaged themselves in a technological race, and this is why they dominate, especially large companies in Japan, they dominate so much uh, the uh, R&D uh, expenditure uh, as a whole. What uh, I would like to emphasize is that at the time they were engaging themselves in this uh, technological race to catch up with uh, uh, the US and with uh, so-called the new economy. Because of some economic constraint, in my view, they have engaged themselves in a human resource management race to the bottom. They had a tendency to cut all kind of expenditure related to human resource management, including uh, what uh, is related to uh, uh, training and uh, uh, improving the, the human uh, resources. The result is this kind of uh, picture that I took from an article I published in the Nikkei Shimbun uh, two, year, two or three years ago, that shows, again, the two figures, uh, the two lines are not uh, correlated, but I think it's quite striking that at the time you observe an uh, increase of uh, uh, expenditure in technology, R&D, you uh, uh, observe a simultaneous decrease in the kind of spending related to uh, um, human resource management and uh, training. Uh, the second case I would like to make concerns the fact that the so-called Silicon Valley model might be true in some specific industries and for some technologies, but it's not true for uh, all technologies. The, in particular, the role of startups, the role of entrepreneurship might be very uh, important in some sectors, uh, as it's shown in these papers that uh, I, I published uh, almost 10 years ago and uh, focusing on the case of next generation robot technology, which is at the basis of uh, personal robots, major players in these industries are still very large uh, companies. You do, you do not see startups. Of course, I gave absolute number of uh, patents, but even relatively, the dominant players are large companies and they are quite successful through a certain number of collaboration because robotics requires a lot of uh, collaboration. 
Well, uh, we call this model not the model of entrepreneurship, but the model of intrapreneurship. So there's still a space in some industries for innovation within large fir firms. So I, we do not deny the importance of uh, startups, but large companies can also play a role. Basically, to summarize before moving in the last part of my talk to a maybe more radical uh, uh, criticism against this dominant view, innovation is not in the air and it's deeply con uh, conditioned by a set uh, of institutions and that's why when we uh, look for policies aiming at promoting uh, innovation, we, uh, we have to be... Uh, to look very uh, cautiously at the relationship between science and uh, society. And if you do so, you will have a more balanced view on the uh, capabilities of the Japanese and French uh, innovation system. Let me move now, let finally in the last five minutes, let, allow me to discuss what we call innovation and allow me to emphasize the importance of society uh, and I think it was already uh, mentioned previously in the very process of innovation. So this uh, part of my argument is taken from a, a book that was published a uh, few years ago. And I think we have a problem these days, uh, in a sense, in the same way uh, some policy, US policy makers in the 60s were saying that we are no all Keynesian, I think we, we became all Schumpeterian. And Schumpeterian in a narrow sense. Uh, the, the, I, I really value uh, uh, the work of Schumpeter. The problem is maybe uh, the neo-Schumpeterian narrow thinking on uh, innovation that, for example, to give you a concrete uh, example, uh, does not emphasize enough the role of controversies and contestation in the innovation uh, process. Following a very uh, interesting uh, article published in Nature in 2017 uh, and showing that, emphasizing the fact that there is increasing gap between uh, the expenditure in uh, research and development and the, uh, the benefits for the society, uh, I would like to emphasize that first, governments in the name of public good should have their say in the direction and in the uh, budget of uh, research and development that should not be uh, entirely uh, private. I would like also to remind you, we cannot put it aside that there are in the society uh, rising doubts about our model of innovation. And it's seen in uh, some controversies these days uh, regarding the COVID uh, crisis. It has been seen in Japan, of course, for good reason, after the Fukushima nuclear uh, accident, but it's more general than this period of uh, crisis. So it's very important to uh, reconcile society and technology, to reconcile people with the innovation process. And for this, it, it is necessary to uh, maybe rethink what is uh, innovation. So, uh, the, the, my feeling, my, my conviction is that the crisis of innovation is a crisis of the relationship between uh, technological innovation and society, and it's very important to reconnect. So it, it means that societies should play a very a much more important role in the process of uh, innovation. How? This is another question I hope we can discuss during the discussion because I still have only one minute and I will not be able to, to enter into the detail. The, the point I would like to make here is that we need to change our vision of innovation. Uh, this pro, uh, vision of innovation, which is dominated by private companies, uh, view innovation as a critical source of differentiation, a source of comparative advantage. It's true from a corporate perspective, but from a social viewpoint, innovation should be mainly a source of well-being. Next step is, of course, to define the criteria of well-being and to set maybe some institution to uh, uh, identify what contributes to increasing well-being and, and what is not uh, increasing the uh, social well-being. 
I will not have time to develop the example I, I prepared regarding the role of society in environmental innovation, the role of society in dealing with demographic uh, challenges. I think I, I, I want to uh, emphasize the role of uh, social sciences and humanities in helping us in putting the criterion of well-being at the center of the process. So, uh, uh, as, as a matter of conclusion, uh, uh, I would like to promote an active role of all stakeholders in the process of innovation, of course industries, of course universities and public research institutes, uh, of course government, but also the society uh, in its diversity. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor de Chevalier. Now we'd like to turn to the uh, Japanese side. So I'd like to ask the, uh, Professor Yoshioka uh, and uh, uh, Kuroka-san to give us your talk. I think that the Yoshioka-san is muted, so. Very sorry, I, I missed the turn on my, my microphone. So thank you for this opportunity. And thank you, Professor Yoshibaria for your insightful keynote speech. So it's very exciting. So in this, in our talk, we will discuss the capability and the legitimacy issues of both the government and the, the, the private sector in the context of innovation policy. So we particularly focus on the strategic coordinations among the actors. The first we argue from a theoretical perspective using some theories in management studies. Then we introduced a case study in Japanese high-tech medical device regulations for further discussion. Okay, so this is a very ideal causal model of innovation policy. Uh, we, when, once we have a well-defined goal, goal in the policy, then we will prepare several uh, policy options to implement the innovation policy. The best policy options including uh, regulations, and the fundings like right, government subsidiaries and the tax reductions. And as long as the, these policy options work effectively, then it promotes research and development activities. So this is a point that how we can realize the effective policy option. In this sense, usually the commitment of you know, funding recipients or interest groups uh, essential. So to achieve this effective policy options, we have two models. One model is, uh, I named that the concentrated model, which means we have a very specific goal and a specific strategy and a relevant project. So this is, you know, for example, we choose a specific innovation goal and we we set the specific research funding program. In this, this kind of model, obviously we can concentrate our investment. So in other words, this project will have uh, much more uh, money or much more resources. But this type of model requires a coordination. How to define a good project? How to formulate the good, sorry, how to formulate a good project? So this is the issue. But another model is the portfolio style. But please do not confuse with the venture capital model. So venture capitalists often take this model. So they, they develop a portfolios of investment. Well, in the context of innovation policy, this means we have several uh, competing projects. Then finally, we pick up the most successful one. So this is a kind of a stage gate model. Well, this type of model, the advantage is obviously the minimization of uncertainty risks of uh, any innovation product. And in, in, in terms of the regulations, this is also uh, beneficial because if we have several competing or parallel regulations, we can choose a uh, best one from changing the environment uh, in the in the changing environment. Well, another, you know, but the disadvantage is clear this is a redundant redundancy and sometimes a conflict Con uh, there is uh, some conflicts among the project or regulations so the next puzzle is that, that we have uh, different uh, actors to coordinate 
the innovations, uh, in the project. So one is the government, another is the government agencies. The final actor is the private sector. Though there is a several uh, negative aspect, which means uh, government often lacks the expertise in the specific innovation areas, and the private sector, which often have uh, which often lack a legitimacy, and also they often face the conflict, strategic conflict. So if we mix, uh, combine these two models and approaches, we can obtain this two by six matrix. Well, here is these examples. Well, let me just focusing on the issues on concentrated models. The concentrated models often associate the coordination or selection issues. So the actors should have a certain capability. While the portfolio management model also requires several capability to develop uh, uh, efficient portfolios. Okay, then let's go dive into the uh, capability of the private sector because sometimes people consider about the private sector is more capable for uh, thinking about the uncertainty. Though I must raise a question about that. One thing is that the corrective decision, one thing is underlying in the corrective, corrective decision making. Once the, this is not only the case for industry, but also the government as well. But once the people uh, make uh, some decisions with their peers, they often re reach to the acceptable, well-known and myopic goals. This is a very, very fundamental behavior of a human being. Another issue is the strategic differences. So even the industry, in, 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 you know, in a, which have a very specific goal, they have several alternative strategic options. Uh, we provide the example in autonomous driving. Uh, as you see, even in autonomous, autonomous driving, there is uh, three different strategies to achieve this goal. And the individual goals has a preferable different players. For example, in the intelligent transportation system is very preferable for these big electric uh, manufacturing companies or I mean, uh, or other you know, infrastructure uh, related system providers. The cloud computing approach is very favorable for telecommunication companies as well as the cloud computing service providers. And edge computing is very good for uh, semiconductor companies. Uh, this is a bit summary, a short summary of the theoretical perspective. Though the concentrated model is uh, often read to, uh, you know, red ocean to the industry, so because they are they will uh, they are likely to choose more safe and acceptable goal, which means not a comparative advantage for them then this leads to the weak commitment from the industry. Well, the, on the other hand, the portfolio management model requires uh, certain capability to develop a good portfolios. So this is uh, some you know, trade-offs. And as uh, Pro Professor Rushibari mentioned that the Japan has certain uh, major, I think certain major to balance these issues. So this is the issue, the major is the hierarchic portfolio models. Uh, this is the case in, in uh, Japanese solar power generation research and development project. They first invest in the typical major companies to, to having a specific goal. But at the same time, they invest to another companies who have different goals. And finally, they choose the very good result from these different projects. Okay, so my theoretical argument reads two questions for further discussions. One is the coordination capability of the private sector. And another question is the legitimacy issue. So the very next section, we will, provide, we will discuss from the one case study from AI medical device. So my colleague, Akio, we will, we will give a talk. So Akio, floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me? So, thank you for introducing me. Uh, uh, following Dr. Yoshoka's presentation, my talk will focus on the introduction of regulation 
uh, for emerging technology, uh, especially focusing on AI medical devices. I will review the process of introducing the regulation in Japan and then uh, discuss its features and challenges. The most important question in considering the introduction of regulation for emerging technology such as AI medical device is how to regulate a group or product with new features and cap capabilities. This process of inter introducing regulation for AI medical devices was roughly as follows. Firstly, regulators attempted to apply the existing regulatory framework uh, to AI medical devices. Second, uh, however, it was found that it could not be properly evaluated due to functions beyond what was expected for a program medical device, SAMD. Therefore, the regulators decided to apply the rules of a current system for the time being while developing new rules. In the absence of appropriate regulatory measures, there is no alternatives but to take provisional measures in the form of applying the existing rules. The result was that any SAMD with even a slight change in functionality would have to be approved as a new and different product. It is a very unique situation. It was a very unique situation. This is a summary of major events uh, related to introduction of regulation, uh, especially uh, medical devices, uh, AI medical devices in Japan. Due to limited time, uh, I can't cover everything, so I only two major events. Uh, I only cover uh, two events. Uh, so. Firstly, uh, the major turning point was when the PMDA, uh, PMDA is the Japanese regulatory body, uh, PMDA compiled a report. In December 2017, uh, the AI expert group of scientific committee established by PMDA uh, compiled the issues and recommendations on AI-based medical diagnostic system and medical device the PMDA report outlined the challenges in applying AI to medical devices from the perspective of regulatory science. In this report, two main points were made. First point is necessity of evaluation methods and systems in line with the characteristic of AI. Second point is necessity of considering evaluation index for diagnostic image device using AI technology. With the uh, report as a starting point, uh, concrete progress was made in the formation of rules for AI medical device in Japan. Uh, specifically, the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare promoted research to create a new evaluation index for AI medical device. Uh, especially uh, diagnosis device. In September 2021, uh, the Pharmaceutical and Medical Device Act was amended. In order to cope with uh, continuously changing the performance of AI medical device, a change plan confirmation procedure system was introduced. This is this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this plan, uh, this uh, system is very new ideas. Under, under this new system, medical devices whose performance is expected to change, such as AI medical devices, are required to submit plans for performance changes in advance. And PMDA will check after a certain period of time whether the planned result have been obtained. Here, I would like to briefly review uh, the trends in the United States. Actually, similar to Japan, the US uh, FDA also took a lot of time to establish an institutionalized method for evaluating medical device, AI medical device. The uh, FDA's regulation took a major step forward with the release of a discussion paper titled 
proposed regulation framework for modification to artificial intelligence uh, machine learning based software as a medical device. In April 2019, in this paper, the FDA proposed a, proposed a basic regulatory framework, adaptive AI medical device. Adaptive means uh, continuously changing functions. In February 2020, uh, the FDA firstly approved, uh, uh, sorry, FDA approved the first uh, adaptive product. In other words, all AI medical device products approved before February 2020 were locked. Uh, locked is uh, not continuously changing. Not, locked means uh, not changing uh, functions. Okay, so from here, I'd like to uh, summarize the insight we gained from this case study. First, I will talk about international relations uh, regarding the introduction of re regulations. First, difficulty in introducing regulation for emerging technology in a timely manner in both Japan and the US. It took a lot of time to introduce regulation for med AI medical device. Second, domestic review process in each country. As for new regulations for emerging technologies, it seems that each country has established its own domestic rule. Uh, in Japan, uh, Japanese government uh, uh, changed uh, uh, all the role uh, the Pharmaceutical and Medical Device Act. And the US government uh, introduced a new guidelines. So therefore, it seems that the regulatory trend in the US did not directly trigger the formation of rules in Japan. And third, future development of harmonization. Harmonization is expected to proceed after the development of domestic rule-making process in each country. So the second finding is the regulatory lag and lack of forecasting. In Japan, unlike other technological field, uh, uh, including nanomaterial and other, uh, especially technological field, uh, funding and regulation of R&D in the medical field has not been planned and implemented based on proper technological forecasting. Uh, for example, the uh, horizon scanning and other uh, forecasting too. The PMDA report was the trigger and the research for regulation on AI medical devices was not started early on. The delay in the introduction of new regulation for emerging technology such as AI medical device uh, case is a problem of regulatory lag. In order to avoid delays in regulation for emerging technology, it is necessary to accurately forecast technology trends and invest in r and related evaluation technologies based on forecast at the, at the right time, at the right time. So actually, in September 2019, the PMDA established the new uh, forecasting to uh, the horizon scanning implementation guideline. The PMDA has introduced horizon scanning on a trial basis. The third is about the uh, limitation of the regula regulator's capabilities. First uh, point, a limitation in the ability of MHFW in designing new regulation for emerging technology. It is difficult for a uh, technological officer to fully understand the te te technical characteristic and plan evaluation method for a highly specialized set of knowledge and technical information. It, uh, second point is limitation of street level capacity of agency. It is not possible to evaluate emerging technologies simply by applying existing frameworks. They cannot deal with anything that isn't clearly defined in the rules. Third point is dependence on international uh, external resources. It is characteristic that is was not the MHLW, but its agency, the PMDA that partic uh, practically sets the regulator, regulatory agenda. 
But the PMDA, actually PMDA is an executive agency, not a planning organization. And the PMDA itself does not have research capacity for uh, regulatory science. So it mobilizes, mobilizes experts as external resources in the form of a scientific committee. So our final finding is a low level of commitment uh, from the private sector. This is a point direct, this is a, a important point because uh, uh, this point is related to the, this, uh, uh, related to the subject of this session. So first point is rule making led by academia. Academia such as the PMDA scientific committee uh, played a major role in the regulation review process. And the private sector's commitment to the regulatory review process was extremely low, extremely low. This is a, a very uh, fantastic, uh, <laughs> uh, how, how can I say, uh, uh, interesting situation uh, in Japanese. Uh, potential, uh, second point is potential uh, asymmetry uh, of information. There should be a clear information asymmetry uh, between the regulation side and the, the, the company side. It is not academia that develops the actual product. Third point is consideration of regulation through industry, academia, government collaboration. Uh, actually, uh, Oi Sensei mentioned, uh, Shurema Sensei mentioned, actually, uh, uh, regarding to the uh, regenerative medicine uh, forum for innovation, the regenerative medicine firm and the Japanese Society for Regenerative Medicine, JSRM. Uh, firm is uh, an industry group. Uh, JSRM is an academia group. So they uh, actually they uh, participated in the collaborative design of regu uh, regulations for uh, medical regenerative medicine. But the, uh, in the case of AI medical device, uh, the process was very, very different. So at the end of this presentation, I would like to raise some issues about the challenge for private companies to participate in rulemaking process. So, uh, firstly, intellectual property uh, confidentiality needs to be protected in the pre provision of information and knowledge about emerging technologies from companies. Otherwise, companies will not be able to participate. On the other hand, it is also essential to consider how to control the possibility that companies will try to design regulation in their favor. This is a very big problem for uh, a re uh, legitimacy aspect. Uh, even with the participation of cooperation, legitimacy is required in the design and implementation of regulations. So to ensure legitimacy, a transparent process and evidence-based review and a government initiative is needed in order to go beyond the knowledge of position of one company, it may be necessary to adjust horizontally as an industry. The challenge will be how to design regulation in a transparent process while protecting the intellectual property of companies. Okay. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, much. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Yoshioka Sensei and uh, Kuroka Sensei for giving us uh, your talk. And uh, yeah, hearing overall structure that the private sector had some how to say the difficulty for the strategic coordination on the one hand, and the government also have difficulty about the capability. So how to bridge that seems yes. to be a big issue. And the academia played some role in some cases, AI, uh, medical devices, but found themselves collaborate in a relatively effective way in the case of regenerative medicine. Yes. So maybe the very important to identify the difficulty and some good cases. Yes. Maybe that can be connected to the issue of the you know, more general post schumperia model of the, the innovation, uh, what uh, was discussed by the Professor de Chevalier. Okay, so, so thank you very much. So now we'd like to turn to the, the discussion session again. And uh, this time I'd like to ask first uh, uh, Kishimoto Sensei to give us your comments. Thank you for 
uh, stimulating presentations. I'd like to comment on two points again uh, that came to my mind, uh, inspired by uh, the presentations. One is about the uh, role of social science and humanities in innovation. The other one is about my concern for recent too much focus on well-being in Japan. Both are mentioned in the last part of the Lucio Barriasson's presentation. I completely uh, agree with Lucio Barriasson's argument. Okay. So uh, the first point uh, is about the social science, the role of social science and humanities in innovation. As a director of the uh, LC Esco Legal Social Issues Center at the Osaka University, I have been promoting industry academia, in the industry university collaboration in the humanities and social science uh, area, mainly with the R&D departments of companies. I think one of the reasons why companies come to us for collaboration is to establish and implement uh, ethical principles and behavioral kind of behavioral guidelines uh, for the uh, researchers and the employees uh, within the companies. The reason behind this, the background is uh, also the pacing problem uh, uh, that uh, Matos and the others uh, uh, earlier mentioned. Uh, in other words, in a world uh, where the speed of technological innovation greatly exceeds the speed of laws and regulations, the only thing that companies can uh, uh, stand by is ethics, not uh, laws. In that sense, the role of social science and humanities in innovation has been underestimated. So promoting innovation through the humanities and social sciences, uh, I don't know exactly how, <laughs> maybe a kind of blue ocean. Okay, th th this is the first point. And the uh, second point is uh, my concern. Uh, suddenly, every, everyone from government to companies, at least in Japan, started to advocate well-being as the ultimate goal. Uh, this phenomenon uh, seems to be very strange uh, for me, but uh, maybe praised in the context, can be praised in the context of the recent focus on social science and humanities, which I think uh, is desirable in itself. Uh, but what concerns me is that the uh, major Japanese technology companies have begun to compete in researching methods and devices to measure individual well-being using biometric data and AI. These activities uh, we also have aspects of surveillance technologies, which could invade individual privacy. It's a kind of, I think it's a kind of paradox that measuring well-being may undermine well-being. So I think when the belief that we are doing good is high enough, it tends to, it tends to make them blind to potential ethical legal and social issues. I think this is also true for the measurement of well-being. Okay, that's it, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you very much, Professor Kishimoto. Maybe two of the issues may directly relating to the uh, Professor Dushibari's point, but then can I ask you to respond first? Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your comment that shows that things are difficult and uh, even in trying to act for the uh, higher well-being of the society, 
we may uh, uh, create some problems affecting directly this uh, well-being. Uh, so so it's, a, it's a good example. And so uh, my point was to uh, emphasize the uh, importance uh, of well-being as a criterion for innovation. But so uh, then we have plenty of questions. And one is how to measure well-being and who is responsible to measure well-being. If we uh, put this in the context of our democracies, people may, uh, citizens, at the occasion of elections, when they decide to, to vote, they may consider that this government did not promote enough their well-being and then not vote for them. So in the context of democracies and with government, I would not say it's easy, but at least there are some mechanisms for people to, to have their say. In the case of uh, uh, innovation, uh, coming from private actors, it's more difficult. And clearly, I'm not promoting uh, intrusion, uh, control by uh, uh, private companies such as uh, Facebook on uh, our taste, on our, uh, our lives. This is not my view. I'm more uh, at, at the former stage saying that it should be a criterion. And then we have several questions, and you, you, gave, uh, you gave example. Uh, so your second comment is also very interesting to, to me regarding the role of uh, social sciences and uh, humanities. I agree with you that a potential contribution of social sciences and humanities is to give some uh, uh, ethical guidelines to uh, to introduce uh, uh, this type of discussion with, uh, with uh, companies. I think it's, uh, it's very important, uh, but the contribution of social sciences and humanities should not be limited to uh, ethical guidelines. Uh, I think one thing what is missing in our uh, discussion so far, and Maybe it's not time for me to discuss the previous, discussion, uh, previous presentation, but I hope we, we have a dialogue. When I heard uh, what uh, Professor Kurokawa said, I was very interested in his call for more uh, collaboration between industries, academia, government. And in the Japanese institutional context, this is what is seen in many of your committees, governmental committees, you have representative of academia, of uh, government and industry. But to me, society is missing. And again, it's a very difficult question. So we will not, for the, 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 the question we are addressing now, uh, very complex. And I should uh, uh, confess that I do not uh, understand <laughs> so much about what has been said about uh, genomic regenerative medicine and, and so on. But we need a voice from the society. And we should not be populist. It's clear that we will not ask uh, Mr. Dupont or Ms. Tanaka to intervene in this committee and to say, no, I, I do not agree, or it's good technology. We don't know. But we need, we need to, uh, to have this goal to have more voices from uh, society. My suggestion. Uh, is that social sciences do not represent society. Uh, they are on the academia side, but they may help, they may contribute to increase the voice uh, uh, of uh, society. And this is uh, the, the core uh, of what I wanted to say. Ethical concerns are important, but the role of uh, uh, SSH should be uh, going further. Thank you very much anyway for your very good comment and showing that the discussion we are having now is very complicated. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your response. Uh, and I noticed that uh, Professor Oe is raising your hand. And uh, can we get some co response comments? Sure. Um, I raised my hand because I was actually thinking through a couple experiences that I've had and how they may bear on this discussion. First, the discussion. We've heard appeals, calls for the participation of society, of firms, uh, government, academia, in processes of risk governance on emerging technologies. 
And at the same time, let us enter that discussion with awareness of, let's call it the blinders, the filters, and the interests that we, we bring to these tables. So I sat on a White House Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, study group uh, on innovation in pharmaceuticals that included all of those groups. I've been on National Academy panels with all of those groups and NIH advisory committee right now with all of those groups. And the good news is that there is much to be said for having diverse groups drawn from many different backgrounds in talking about risk. And I don't mean it only in terms of a theory of participation and representation. The quality of the risk assessments improves when you have people with different backgrounds, when it's not simply having people that are technocratic risk assessors doing those sorts of processes. Diversity and perspective often translates into better risk assessment, even by a nearly scientific definition. That said, there's a potential problem. And the potential problem is that no one comes to the table without particularistic interests that they speak from. As an academic, every time I've been in a meeting with NSF or NIH or the White House, academics are always saying that the answer to the problems requires a great addition in increased expenditures on research in academia. risk governance, and they're interested in regulations and policies that may or may not address environmental health, safety, and security risks, but they're typically interested in those regulations with the characteristics or the forms that will limit competition, deny entry to new entrants, secure subsidies for them, or secure relief from oversight. Uh, if we're talking about civil society, um, the question of who represents society is, in fact, a very difficult one. And non-governmental organizations often play that role in conferences, but the interest of a non-governmental organization is a lot more specific oftentimes than broad societal interests. They're, like all other organizations, interested in membership and access to information and in funding. And government. Our good bureaucrats, our good civil servants are often very publicly spirited. And in fact, I, I was saying nice things about civil servants in Japan as being both competent and publicly spirited, but they're also worried. They're worried about the legitimacy of their uh, recommendations being undercut. They're worried about elbowing out or being elbowed by other organizations. And it has been, has been mentioned by Professor Matsuo, jurisdictions are often very vaguely defined in this space. And the question of who has the authority to act is always on their minds. So the point, I applaud the foundation for setting up this discussion and the way that you've included attention to these broader issues. But the concern that I have is that we move beyond um, the notion that we certainly want to have representation and engagement, but we need to do so with attention to the particularistic interests that each of these elements, government, academia, firms, civil society, we have to do this with our eyes open to where people are coming from and to the structuring of processes so that potential conflicts of interest across these actors may not neutralize each other, cancel each other out, but perhaps the conflicts can be harnessed in creative ways to take us a little bit closer to truth. And I'll, I'll stop on that. I had no intention of going so long and I apologize for doing so, so late in the evening. Uh, sorry, in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th th thank you very much for the thoughtful input. And, uh, you know, originally I framed the agenda that uh, there is a uh, so have to say the difficulty of coordination between the company because of that there is a potential role for the government and academia, but the government and academia, of course, has a vested interest. So, in that context, how to deal with that? that that's a, a big, very important issue, and also maybe that, that's one of the big objective of the research project itself. So, how to restructure the process of the interaction among the actors? So, that's a very important uh, issue to, uh, identified, I think. 
Okay. Um, so now, can we turn to the, the Suzuki Sensei? Okay. Um, thank you very much. And I, I, I hate to be um, the somewhere in between the, the session and the lunch. So I, I'll just make it uh, very quick. Um, so uh, thank you very much for uh, Professor Le Chevalier uh, for, um, for this uh, excellent uh, presentation. And uh, I think that there is a, a very uh, interesting proposal that, you know, I, I think uh, Professor Yoshioka's uh, Professor Yoshoka and uh, Professor Kurokawa's uh, presentation were pretty much pessimistic about Japan, whereas the um, Professor Lushibari's uh, 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 expose was more uh, um, more optimistic about Japan. And I think there is a, there is a very good balance of the uh, of the you know bright side and the dark side of Japan. Um, but anyway, I, I think there is an interesting uh, proposal by uh, Professor Lucie Barrier about the um, <coughs> a contrast between the um, uh, the neo schumpeterian model and the the more uh, society oriented government collaborative uh, 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 innovation model, and I think this is. Uh, this is pretty much uh, in line with the uh, the regulation uh, theories, and I think there is the emphasis on the Toyotism and the you know the worker uh, manager co collaborations and you know the, the the ethics coming out from the workplaces. I think these are also the good side of Japan, and I think these are the source of the strength of the Japanese R and D and the innovation. But the problem is that the 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 assumption of the uh, Toyotism and the, the regulation uh, uh, argument were basically closed before the globalization, globalization starts. I, I think there is a, a, a fundamental game change took place when the Japan was forced to open uh, in terms of the finance, in terms of the you know the open up the market and and Toyota, for example, has been very successful as a global company, but that's a very exceptional case. Um, if you look at the Japanese banks, Japanese uh, 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 construction companies, uh, th there are many sectors which faced the a uh, lot of problem of the what the uh, uh, Professor Yoshoka has mentioned as you know diving into the red ocean, and I think this has uh, the particularly uh, this is true for the electronic uh, electronics. Um, I mean uh, semiconductor, um, the the current problem of the uh, uh, Toshiba is is a is a good good example, and I think <coughs> the problem of the uh, the companies um, collaboration under the uh, globalization or the, the flexible market situation is that there is very limited channels to to collaborate or to to create a dialogue and I think um, uh, there, there is a lot of pressure international pressure for being in 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 the competitive market and the there is no luxury for the Japanese companies to um, to play to to continue to have such uh, a, 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 a diversified, a very uh, rich um, engagement between the management and the, and the labor. And I think the reason why there are so so much neo uh concepts. Uh, penetrated into a Japanese society is because they found that that's the only way to communicate between the market, society, or the, the company communicate with society through market. And that, I, I think that that is the sort of a fundamental change of the discussion and and I, I'm sure that you, you would have a different view, but uh, I'll be I'll be happy to uh, to uh, to discuss with that, and 
uh, and the, there is a different kinds of rationality uh, have been introduced in the concept and understanding of how to deal with the uh, the uh, labor and, uh, and and the manager management and the company and the society and i think this is largely because of the the, the bust of bubble in the uh, early 1990s and the Jap japanese companies and the governments and and the you know or basically the society as a whole has lost the confidence of the previous you know, the model of innovation and i think the what is uh, what is important is to restore such a confidence in order to make the what uh, professor louis chevalier's uh, argument more uh, more more constructive to to apply for for the Japanese society today, and I think uh, this goes on to the uh, discussion of the Professor Yoshioka's um, uh, problem of the legitimacy of the government the regulations and uh, uh, and and the di difficulties of the collaboration of the private actors. I think this is uh, uh, the flip side of the coin is the. Uh, the question of taking risks. The Japanese companies are now being afraid of taking risks and trying to avoid the risk as much as possible. And I think this is, uh, uh, this is uh, closely related to this loss of confidence of what happened in, uh, in the, in, in, during the uh, high economic growth until 19, 1980s. So, I think this is um, perhaps the very um, difficult question to how to to regain the, the confidence and and taking risks uh, is is one of the big issue with regard to the you know uh, 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 investing into the much more challenging innovations and and and. Um, and creating the sort of a uh, dynamic uh, uh, society, in, you know, the dynamic relationship between the company and the society. And I think the uh, Professor Kurokawa has mentioned, I, I think that this regulatory culture, which is sort of a, um, enabling this sort of a loss of confidence. It's, it's kind of uh, crazy to say this, but I think this, uh, institutional um, setup as and uh, institution cr creates the sort of a um, past dependence and you know trying to avoid taking a, a, a new risk and uh, challenging the new uh, new item because you know at the end of the day it is the regulatory body which doesn't take the risk and that's what uh, the AIs uh, uh, you know the the medical equipment the the software as a medical medical devices uh, issue, the, the approval and the licensing of this uh, um, technology, new technology, has uh, demonstrated a good example that you know, you know, they they are not taking the risks, and largely because they are not capable of taking a risk because of the lack of the regulatory basis, and they don't have the legislative basis. But at the same time, I think they are not uh, uh, acting as as an agent of of change. They are not acting as you know making a proposals and to try to change the uh, the the situation because they don't want to take a risk. So I, I think this is one of the um, basis of the uh, uh, problem. So I think uh, these two um, presentations were pretty um, uh, uh, creating a contrast, and I think th it both shows the current situation in Japan, I think, but at the, at the same time, I think it, it highlights the questions about the Japanese attitude towards the, the taking risks, and that is directly related to the question of innovation. So I'll stop there, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the, the, the comments, and. Uh, Maybe the time is running up, but I'd like to get a short response from the Professor Du Chevalier and also from the, the Professor Yoshioka. You know, the, the question, basic question seems to be that what's the, 
how to say, the condition for re-establish the kind of a collaboration. So under the changes, uh, the difficult situation. So the first, uh, uh, can I ask the Professor de Chevalier to respond? Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for your excellent comments. So there is a possibility that the situation has changed dramatically and we need to really change our model. So I agree that globalization means something and has changed the condition for uh, uh, collaboration, the condition for innovation. I'm not promoting uh, coming back to the good old times. They never existed. Uh, I, maybe I, I would just briefly say two things. First, I, I do not think that uh, globalization is exogenous to Japan. It is maybe uh, exogenous to, say, Senegal, Kazakhstan, but Japan has been and still is a major player of globalization and uh, should be more self-confident in its ability to influence the global rules. And this ambition has, has been lost somewhere. I don't know why, I don't know where, but should be uh, uh, re-promoted. Uh, the second point is uh, Clearly, the, the uh, current model applied to the Japanese case, so technological race uh, uh, associated to race to the bottom in the field of uh, human resources, is a failure to me. That did not show impressive results in terms of uh, innovation capability. So I'm just simply looking for other models. So collaborative model could be uh, could be uh, answer. Uh, I put on the table the issue of well-being with all the risks that were uh, mentioned uh, previously. Well-being for uh, various uh, stakeholders, employees. I, I don't think it's a good strategy to, uh, to uh, compress uh, their uh, the investment in, in their capabilities. And well-being for, of course, consumers. Huh? Um, we are living in a market economy. So if we are not... Uh, if Japanese companies are not able to show that their products are increasing the well-being or the satisfaction of consumers, we have a problem. So we, we should extend, uh, or we should really focus more on stakeholders such as consumers and employees. And of course, I'm not completely sure that the old style regulation theory model is still completely uh, accurate in the present situation, but nonetheless, we cannot be satisfied with the current direction. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. So how about Professor Yoshikoka? Yes, thank you. So I'm only responding to the comments about the, the risk taking behaviors of industry, as well as the question about the confidence to the former uh, Japanese, or not only Japanese, but also to some European models of innovations. My answer is that, the learning from failure or learning the causality is essential. And this is related to the contribution of social science to the innovation activities. So because the social science often uh, focuses on the identification of the causality. So for example, innovation studies have been identified what kind of the obstacles for the innovation diffusion. So the same thing is applicable to the science innovation policy. So what kind of the uh, policy options will lead to the failure? Then we, we will be confident about the specific acti activities. So uh, my, my, my comment is that to stop punishing the failure about uh, promoting the running from failures. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, you know, I see the Professor Oe is raising your hand, so I'd like to ask you to comment. And also there is one comment from the participant, uh, 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 Professor Tatsu Suzuki, and uh, he's raising a question of the independent load of the independent scientific advisors. <laughs> we are discussing about the best interest of the scientific advisor, but the, what is the potential role of the independent scientific advisor and where should be located? So please respond <laughs> to that question also. Uh, pr okay. Professor Oe, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two quick points. First, on the independent advisor matter, uh, it's a good model but it's also a model that's just so hard to implement. The best example that I can think of in the United States is the Office of Technology Assessment. It was created to report to the Congress. It operated with a degree of independence and integrity, and it no longer exists. 
And the reason why it no longer exists is in part because it took on a difficult mission, evaluating the Reagan administration's uh, ballistic missile defense systems, and it concluded that they wouldn't work. And that was not an answer that was too popular with elements within the Congress, and all of a sudden they were out of business. Um, independent assessment and advice, um, the NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, operates independently of the FAA when it does its investigations of crashes and evaluation of a variety of designs and technologies. And they have survived. And they've survived with independence from the FAA, but making recommendations to that regulatory agency and to the airlines. Bottom line, two-headed approaches where you have the regulators regulating and independent agencies evaluating, assessing, and investigating is a good model. Second point, thinking very hard about the recommendations and thoughts about what private industry can do, I'm going to offer a small story with identities disguised. So friends who work in industry and really want to be engaging with risk, gathering the information, evaluating what's going on, thinking ahead, to have the information required to make judgments often run into huge fights in their companies when they propose looking. And what they run into are people that say, don't ask, don't tell, don't look. You might come up with the wrong answer. You might come up with the answer that something is dangerous or wrong. And that could threaten the investments that we've made. The arguments that they make against that position are to say, before you put a billion dollars down on X, wouldn't you like to know more? Um, and they'll make an argument for information gathering in an adaptive risk governance context. But let's not fool ourselves again. Um, there's plenty of resistance in, in many quarters to looking hard at potential hazards, potential hazards that may threaten the viability of investments uh, made and investments to be made. Thanks again. Yeah, yeah th thank you very much. And the potential role of the investor is also a very interesting point. And finally, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Lushibarie one point, and that's relating to the question raised by Professor Arimoto in the previous session, the, you know, the balancing between the basic science and technology policy. So you mentioned in your presentation about, uh, you know, the one of the characteristic uh, which is conflicting with the Schumpeteritarian scenario is the linkage to the, the, the scientific, uh, uh, the, you know, the work. So, so, so how, what should be the governance mechanism you know, for, for the scientific research, well, especially the basic scientific research and how that's related to the innovation issue? Mm -hmm. uh, if you have the comment mm -hmm. on this point, we'd like to hear from mm -hmm. you. Th thank you very much. It's a very important question and very difficult one. My, my answer will be simple. My view is that with few exceptions, uh, industries, private sector uh, is not well uh, equipped or not motivated enough uh, in uh, developing uh, basic uh, research. There are many counterexamples, and Professor Oi may give many uh, in uh, uh, um, R&D department of major uh, US companies, but I would say that for some reason in, in the Japanese uh, context, in companies like uh, Toyota or other companies, they have financial means to engage themselves in uh, basic research. My view is that they are not uh, doing it enough. In this context, clearly, if it's not done by private uh, players, at least not done enough, it should be uh, clearly uh, a key contribution of, of the government. And uh, I'm not here to say that the budget should incre be increasing for, for, the, for the universities, but it's true that uh, it's very important to, to balance both and to rebalance them. The effort should be much larger uh, on the side of the government, given the uh, relative uh, uh, cautiousness of private actors to engage themselves in this uh, basic research. It can be also done, of course, in a collaborative uh, framework, as I know you are very much interested in this. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for uh, participating in the active discussion. So sorry uh, for delaying about the 15 minutes uh, uh, compared to the original plan.
But I thought that uh, we have a very active discussion and uh, we can set up a basic issue we have to think about for the next uh, two years. So we'd like to have kind of this kind of opportunity again at some moment. And uh, we welcome the participation of all of you. And also uh, the, the Tokyo Foundation has a, a website and uh, in that we put already some small uh, a review article and we will expand that. And uh, so please look at uh, those uh, papers. And if you have any comment or other question, please respond to us. So thank you, thank you very much, Professor Oe and Professor De Chevalier uh, for, for the keynote uh, speeches and also the active discussion by the uh, project member and also the participant. Thank you very much. And we'd like to close uh, this seminar.